In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In a moment of silence, let us acknowledge God's presence in our midst and ask Him to pour His Spirit into our hearts to recognize Jesus in our study. God, our Heavenly Father, on this first Bible study of the year, we want to thank you in a special way for the opportunity you gave us to enter into this year. We thank you for this gathering of your children. We thank you for the gift of Jesus to us. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the gift of the mass. And we thank you for the gift of one another. We ask you to anoint us with your spirit. Open our minds and hearts to what you have for us this evening. May we internalize your word and may your word transform us and bear fruit in our lives. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray for us. Angels and saints of God, intercede for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning and good evening, all, depending on where you are at the moment. I say Happy New Year to you all, and I hope you enjoyed your Christmas and New Year celebrations. Anyhow, I welcome you all to our online Bible study. The topic for today's Bible study is the offering of bread and wine at Mass. The offering of bread and wine at Mass. Some of the questions that will arise in this study are, as some of the liturgical actions we carry out in this part of Mass empty actions, if not, what do they mean? What does the bread we offer at Mass symbolize? And what does the wine symbolize? What does the mixing of wine and water symbolize? It is our ardent hope that this study will help us understand what we do at Mass in this area. My references in this discussion will include the Catechism of the Catholic Church, general instruction on the Roman Missa, understanding the Mass by Charles Belmont, the Mass by Reverend Guy Aury, the Mass by Cardinal Donald Wall and Mike Aquilina, the Mass by Edward Street, the Catholic Mass revealed by Thy Kingdom Come, how not to say the Mass by Dennis Mulaski, the Liturgy, the Work of the Holy Spirit by Abbot Jeremy Driscoll, and Understanding the Order of Mass in the Light of Vatican II by Brother Pius Ajiman. Now, let us proceed with our study. And I want our reader to please read Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 to 20 for us. Genesis 14, 17 to 20. Genesis 14, 17 to 20. After his return from the defeat, defeat of Chadulman and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, 
that is the king's valley. And the king Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God's most high. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him one-tenth of everything. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At Mass, the faithful present their individual gifts during the offertory collection. But as I said before, the main gifts we offer at Mass are the bread and the wine. After the priest receives the offering from the representatives of the faithful, the bread and wine needed for the sacrifice are placed on the altar, while the other gifts for the needs of the clergy and the poor are placed at other suitable places. The first of the two main gifts offered at Mass is the bread. But what kind of bread do we use? As we said in our earlier studies, the Jewish Passover in Egypt is a type for Jesus' redemptive sacrifice on the cross, which we reenact at Mass. The bread eaten by the Jews in Egypt and later by their descendants during the Passover feast to commemorate the first Passover was unleavened bread, considering that the Jews left Egypt in a hurry. I invite our reader to please read Exodus 12, 17 to 18 for us. Exodus 12, 17 to 18. You shall observe the festival of unleavened bread. For on this very day, I brought your companies out of the land of Egypt. You shall observe this day throughout your generations as a perpetual ordinance. In the first month, from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day, you shall eat unleavened bread. The word of the Lord. And be to God. As you can see from the reading we just heard, the festival that God commanded the Israelites to repeat during their Passover was supposed to be a festival of unleavened bread. Similarly, what we use at Mass today is azim or unleavened bread. Charles Belmont informs us that the azine bread we use at mass was actually introduced in the ninth century to recall the unleavened bread that Jesus used during the last supper. Before this time, the first Christians used ordinary unleavened bread for their celebration. Nevertheless, they used the best bread available to them and this was usually marked with the cross of Jesus or any other symbol for Christ. Now, there is a great symbolism in the use of bread. First, bread is food that is common everywhere. But more importantly, the bread we eat is formed from many grains of wheat. As St. Paul says, the one bread makes us one body, though we are many in number, the same bread is shared by all. Confess 1 Corinthians 10, 17. So even though at mass we are different people from different places, in Christ we become one, one body. Just as the different grains, grains are formed into one loaf of bread. Then the wine we use is from human work. The trampling and crushing of the grapes in the wine press is like a symbol of grief and suffering. From the spiritual standpoint, it expresses our desire to make amends and to change by penance and reparation 
are damaged human nature. So it reminds us that, that we have this desire and should actually work towards it, that desire to amend and change by penance and reparation our damaged human nature, which means coming to mass, we should have that sincere desire to amend our lives. After receiving the gifts offered by the faithful, the priest goes to the altar of sacrifice to prepare the altar and the gifts. He places the chalice, ciborium, corporal, purificator on the altar, as well as the sacramentary or the missal. With that, he prepares the gifts. Standing there, he takes the pattern with the bread, that is the large host, for consecration and raising it slightly above the altar. He praises God using words which have their roots in Jewish tradition. He says, blessed are you Lord God of all creation for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer, fruit of the earth and the work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Usually he says this prayer inaudibly as the people sing the offertory hymn. But where the offertory hymn is not sung, he may say the words aloud. In this case, the people respond, blessed be God forever at the end. Then he drops the pattern with the large holes on the copra. After offering the bread, the priest moves a bit to the right side of the altar. Then he cleans the chalice with a purificator, pours wine into it and adds little water to it, praying inaudibly by the mystery of this water and wine. May we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. I repeat, by the mystery of this water and wine, May we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Now, the wine and water used in this part of the liturgy are symbolic. In this case, the wine is the more important of these two elements. The wine represents divinity. It represents the divinity of Christ while the water represents our humanity. As in Cyril, as in Cyprian put it, the wine represents Christ and the water, the redeemed people of God, that is ourselves, the faithful, and our human nature. The practice of mixing some water with the wine is an ancient tradition. The Jews did that during the celebration of the Last Supper. And we believe that Jesus himself did the same at the Last Supper. In fact, Reverend Auri points out that both Jesus during the institution of the Eucharist and later the apostles themselves and the early Christians observed this Jewish custom of mingling water and the wine. This part is also clear from the testimonies of some church fathers, such as St. Justin, St. Irenaeus, and St. Cyprian. Now, just as the wine and the water are themselves symbolic, the practice of mixing or mingling them in the liturgy is equally very symbolic. In fact, Belmont maintains that the practice has a profound theological significance among Christians, even though it was also a common practice in the ancient world. It symbolizes the joining of ourselves to Christ and our humanity to divinity. So just as the water is added to the wine, it symbolizes the joining of ourselves to Christ and our humanity to divinity. For St. Cyprian in particular, who dwells so much on this liturgical practice, dropping water in the wine during the celebration of the Mass is also a sign or an indication 
that the church representing us means to participate in the divine sacrifice of Christ. It means that Christ alone is not the one going to offer himself in sacrifice, that we are prepared to participate in his divine sacrifice by offering ourselves along with him. Nevertheless, Charles Belmont has more to say here. He says that the mixing of water and wine points to the incarnation of Christ, that is the mystery of God becoming man or sharing in our human nature. According to him, it also points to our call to share in Christ's divine life, the call to become partakers of the divine nature. Confess 2 Peter 1 verse 4. So it symbolizes an invitation. We have been invited to partake in the life of Christ, to partake in his divine nature. So each time we see the priest mingling water and wine, remember that we are called to partake in the divine life of Christ, to be joined to Christ, to join our humanity to his divinity. Furthermore, the meeting of the two elements signifies a mystical union with Christ. In this case, we become one with Christ ahead. Just as the wine absorbs the water in the chalice so that the two cannot be separated, so too the church represented by the people is joined to its head, Christ, in a way that nothing can separate them. Abba Jeremy Driscoll has more to add here. He maintains that the mixing of the wine in the chalice with little water is a mystery. And in this concrete something that we see, there is a hidden reality. As we stated before, the wine is the more precious or the more important of the two elements, and it represents divinity, while water represents a poor humanity. The message arising from this gesture is that in offering the wine, which represents himself, Christ is not just going to offer himself alone to the Father. No, he will not go alone to the Father, but he's joining us to himself to take us to the Father. For this reason, St. Cyprian of Carthage stated in the 10th century that we should never offer the wine without water, since that would be like offering Christ without his people. From all we are saying here, you can see why I told you in the past that to appreciate the things we do at Mass, to do them well and benefit spiritually from them, we need understanding and we need our imagination and faith, just as we need the enlightenment and help of the Holy Spirit throughout Mass. Transformation comes from, the, uh, from that ability to be able to enter into, flow with, and be penetrated in our minds and hearts by what we are doing. That is the sacred mysteries we celebrate at Mass. As Driscoll maintains, these liturgical actions described here as mysteries are things we need to pay attention to. Actually, it is the priest that we can see with our eyes, but the hidden reality is Christ himself beginning his spirit, sorry, beginning his priestly action of leading our prayer. We have placed our gifts in his hands, and since he is really our priest, and it is through his hands that these gifts will be offered to the Father. So at this point, he begins to carry out his ministry. After mixing the wine and water, the priest returns to the center of the altar to offer the wine. Lifting the chalice slightly above the altar, he praises God again inaudibly, saying this time around, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine you, we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become a spiritual drink. 
Again, if the offertory song is not being sung or it has ended, he says it aloud and the congregation responds in an acclamation type, blessed be God forever. I repeat, in an acclamation form, blessed be God forever. Then the priest places the chalice on the corporal on the altar, bowing in profound humility and offering both the gifts themselves and ourselves in union with Christ's sacrifice of himself on the cross. He prays inaudibly saying, with humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. An important thing to note in this prayer is the line that says, may we be accepted by you. This prayer lays critical emphasis on the fact that in offering those gifts on the altar to God, we are actually offering ourselves who are represented by the gifts because at mass our lives are bound up with the bread and wine we have offered to the Lord to represent ourselves. As Cardinal Bonner advises, when the priest raises the bread and later the wine to offer them to God, he ought to put his heart there too. And likewise, the hearts of all those present, that is of all the faithful, and offer them to God, that their hearts and lives may be transformed to make them more like Christ in character, just as the bread and wine will be transformed into the body and blood of Christ. At Mass, we want God to accept us as poor as we are and transform us by his grace into the likeness of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, there's another aspect of the prayer that says, with humble spirit and contrite heart. This part can be traced to the three Hebrew young men in Daniel chapter 3, who were thrown into the burning furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar. I invite Adida to please read Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 to 21 and 39 to 40 from the New American Bible version. Daniel 3, 19 to 21. Nebuchadnezzar's face became livid with utter rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times more than usual. Twen seven times more than usual and had some of the strongest men in his army bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the white hot furnace. They were bound and cast into the white hot furnace with their trousers, shirts, hats, and other garments. 39. But with contrite heart and humble spirit, let us be received as though it were a burnt offering of rams and bulls or tens of thousands of fat lambs. So let our sacrifice be in your presence today and find favor before you. For those who trust in you cannot be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to Belmont, in making a similar petition to God at mass, the priest mindful of his own sins and the need to repent in order to be accepted by God proclaims his own unworthiness to offer the sacrifice of the new covenant. But also like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, on behalf of the entire congregation, he also cries out to God with a humble spirit and a contrite heart, asking him to accept us as a sacrifice pleasing to him. In conclusion, from all we have discussed today, it is easy to see that the Catholic Mass is extremely rich and profound. A lot 
is said through the symbols we use. We need to cherish what we have and be, term, be determined to do it well and get all the spiritual benefits we can from it. So my final word to all of us is to strive always to follow all that you do at Mass wholeheartedly. That is, with an open mind, with deep attention and complete openness of mind and spirit. May the good Lord bless his word in our hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Today we shall be praying with First Kings, First Kings chapter seventeen, from verse eleven to verse sixteen. First Kings seventeen eleven, or let me start from verse eight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the moment of silence, let us thank God for this new year. The last two years have not been easy at all. But here we are. Some of us may not even know how we survived these two years. But I know God carried you. God carried me. And that is why we survived these two terrible years. So let us thank him for carrying us when we could no longer survive on our own. Let us thank him for carrying our families. And if he has carried us into this year, it is because he has a plan for us. He's not done with us. Let us pray for the grace to face where God is facing. For the grace to drop our own human desires, for the great grace to drop our own will and focus on God's own will. As human beings, it can be very tough. It can even be painful sometimes because what we are looking for is not what God is asking of us. Let us pray that God will root out of us, out of our lives, whatever is not of him. That God will quench any fire in us that is not his own fire. That he will rekindle his own fire in our lives. The fire of the Holy Spirit. That our desires will be desires for God and the things of God. That this year, we will not make it primarily about ourselves, but primarily about God and what God wants to do with us. Pray, God, take over my life. Break my resistance in any way. Lord, break my resistance in any way. Take over my life. I belong to you. If you continue to wait for me, I may never, I may never look where you want me. To. I never, I may never do what you expect of me. Hijack my life. Take over my life. Arrest me. And use me wherever I want to use me. Arrest my mind. Arrest my thinking. Arrest my desires. Let my life this year be first and foremost about you. Let it be only about you. Let every other thing that is good be secondary. Today, 
let us also make a decision that since this year we primarily about God and God wants the salvation of my brothers and sisters, I will be his leg to reach my brothers and sisters. I will be his hands. I will be his voice to reach them. Decide that this year you will draw people to this Bible study and not just this Bible study to programs that can help them grow. That this year, just as Eli helped Samuel hear the voice of God, that this year, even though I'm an unfinished product myself, in spite of the shortcomings I see in my own life, I will help people find God. I will help people in their own struggle. Even as I struggle, I will help them in their own struggle. Make a decision. Uh, Lord, I will not take people away from you this year. I will lead them to you. I will point out Christ to them. Help me with your grace. Finally, we pray with the passage I mentioned. First Kings chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. Then Yahweh spoke to Elijah, go to Zarephath of the Sidonites and stay there. I have given word to a widow there to give you food. So Elijah went to Zarephath. On reaching the gate of the town, he saw a widow gathering sticks. He called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called after her and said, bring me also a piece of bread. But she answered, as Yahweh your God lives, I have no bread left but only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And I'm just now gathering some sticks so that I may go in and prepare something for myself and my son to eat and die. Elijah then said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and then make some for yourself and your son. For this is the word of Yahweh, the God of Israel. The jar of meal shall not be emptied, nor shall the jug of oil fill until the day when Yahweh sends rain to the earth. So she went and did as Elijah told her, and she had food for herself. Elijah and her son, from that day on, the jar of flour, of the jar of flour was not emptied, nor did the jug of oil fill in accordance with what Yahweh has said to Elijah. I want you to stand on whatever word that touched you in the reading and begin to talk to God in your heart. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Is there anything right now that is making you afraid? Can you relate to those words? Do not be afraid. Even myself, I can relate to those words. Do not be afraid. The Lord is saying, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. That thing will not kill you. That thing will not destroy you. Whatever is bringing fear to your life, that thing itself will be conquered. That thing itself will be overwhelmed. If only you can obey the voice of God, that says, do not be afraid. So I ask you now to spiritually or with faith, lift up that thing, no matter how heavy it may be, place it in the waiting hands of God and say, Lord, with faith, I place these things in your hands as I obey your words that I should not be afraid.
And even now, as you place those burdens in his hands, I want you to let go. One thing that will show that you have truly placed those burdens in his hands is that the tension in your life will begin to go away now. Peace we begin to return to your soul. Peace, bye-bye to tension. Welcome to peace. Peace because you know that your burdens are now placed in his hands. Your fears are now placed in his hands and that God will not disappoint you. Elijah said to him, the jar of me shall not be emptied, nor shall the jug of oil fill, and it was so. What is that precious thing you need for your survival, for your sustenance, that is failing? What is failing in your family? What is failing in your life? God can reverse it. Say to him, Lord, you're the God who restores. Your word is that I will restore the years eaten by locusts. Whatever is failing in my body that, that, that I need to survive, Lord, restore in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever is failing in my marriage, whatever is failing in my life, whatever is failing in my business, whatever is failing... Whatever that is crucial, that is failing in any area of my life, in my relationships, Father, let there be a restoration in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for your divine touch upon the life of everyone under my voice. I pray for your divine touch upon the lives of your children who have placed their burdens in, in your hands, your children who are hidden those words do not be afraid. And I pray that you will shatter their fears in the name of Jesus Christ and restore peace and joy to their lives. Let there be, oh Lord, full restoration beyond their own expectations. Let there be breakthrough upon their lives in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And as you have enabled us to begin this year, we, play, we pray that this year will be filled with your abundance that this year will be filled with your abundance, that this year will be filled with abundance in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We remember in a special way, one of us at this Bible study who is celebrating her 70th birthday today. She has thanked you at mass. We lift her up before you and pray that the remainder of her life will be extremely fruitful before you. May she give you glory and may your favors be multiplied upon her life. May she know increase and never decrease in anything positive. We pray, O oh Lord, that as she has given you thanks today, that you multiply her joy, multiply her blessings, and that of her family through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst men, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and day of our death. Amen. Archangel Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Our guardian angels, pray for us. All you angels and saints of God, pray for us. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the Almighty God bless you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy New Year once again and have a blessed week. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe for more videos like this.